Good morning. Today is Tuesday, August 10th, uh, 2021. This is Arlington County. This is Arlington County Board of Equalization hearings. There's three cases on the agenda. The first item on the agenda is RPC 0701101 at 4400 Lee Highway. Ms. Eileen Borman is here to represent the owner. And Ms. Borman, you can start with your eight minutes and tell us about the property. You're muted, Eileen. Ms. Borman, your microphone. Thank you. Actually, my colleague, Jordan Harmon, is going to be presenting this case. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah, thank you, Eileen and Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. Thank you all for meeting with me today. I appreciate your time and consideration on this case. This property is the Woodley Arms Apartments. It is located on Lee Highway, just east of Glebe Road. It was built in 1960 and has an effective age of 1960. So it's a 60 year old property. Uh, the main purpose of this appeal is if you'd be so kind as to turn to the county's test page on page three of the appeal packet. You'll see that the property saw a spike in vacancy and collection in 2020. The total vacancy and collection, as you can see just below row 10 on page three, went from 6% in 2018, 6% in 2019, up to 11% in 2020. Now the assessment only used 6%. So this is important because this this 5% jump in vacancy and collection led to a reduction in overall NOI of 8.41%. The assessment only went down by 2%. As we're all familiar, the Code of Virginia does require for uh, multifamily properties that the actual gross income generated from such real property and any resultant loss in income attributable to vacancies, collection losses, and rent concessions be considered when determining fair market value. We believe that the guideline rate of 6% was applied in error and should the actual vacancy and, and collection of 11% should have been applied to this property. Again, this resulted in a significant impact to the overall NOI. Uh, this property again is a 60 year old apartment building, 91 units, uh, saw a significant increase in vacancy and collection that did impact the NOI in 2020. Additionally, we, we believe that a 25 basis point increase in the cap rate is appropriate. This is because of the current market environment and what we have seen from uh, investors in apartment buildings. Several surveys have, sh have supported a increase in the uh, cap rate from 2020 to 2021, largely due to changes in market conditions, uh, as I'm sure you can know from the pandemic largely. Uh, the cap rate on the assessment remained the same from 2020 to 2021. We believe that the risk of investing in this type of property has increased over the past 12 months. So, in summary, we, we believe the assessment should have used, uh, have con considered and applied the actual vacancy that the property experienced in 2020 instead of the guideline rate of 6%. Uh, this, this again did affect the NOI significantly, it reduced the NOI year over year by 8.4%. The assessment only was only reduced by 2%. So, Vacancy and collection is the, the main argument, and then the cap rate, we believe, should also be increased to compensate for the increased risk for this type of property. Thank you. Mary, you on mute. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, thank you, sir. Mr. Bailey for the county, please. Good morning, board. Today we will be discussing the view for Woodley Arms Apartments. Um, pretty sure you're already on page three, so let's just stay there. 
you look at the history of this property, um, the way the county did, uh, you can see that the property was stabilized and actually showed increases in gross potential income and effective growth income from 2017 to 19. Uh, in 2020, the property, like many other properties, did experience high vacancy and some increases in rent loss. Um, actually, concessions were pretty stable for this property. So the main factors for this property was vacancy and rent loss. And you can see that on line item eight and nine. So for this problem, we did a test. Um, as you can see, our original apartment revenue was reduced by $30,000. Um, it actually came in 60,000 less than what they reported for 2020. Um, when you compare the apartment revenue, our gross potential income in the test column, which is column F compared to column E, is about 59, almost $60,000 less than what they reported in 2020. Um, then we get down to the expenses. Uh, the property showed an uh, increase in 2018, but if you look at 2017, 18, and 19, uh, those expenses went up and then back down. And then in 2020, the expenses went down a little bit further, but not a whole lot. Uh, expenses used by the county on the original assessment as well as the test are higher than what they reported for 2020. When you compare the actual expenses just looking at 2019 and 2020 the average is around nine hundred forty five thousand uh, dollars and you can see the test column is about seven eight hundred dollars higher than what they reported the noi again from 17 to 19 uh, there was a dip but then they increased again um, and then another smaller dip from 19 to 20 when you compare uh no sorry confusing it with the test column when you look at 2019, there was a dip um, when they got to 2020. That original assessment, we projected an actual decline in NOI. Um, with the test, we reduced our projected NOI a little bit more based off the of information that we received. Uh, the two-year NOI average is around $880,000. You can see that the test column came in lower than that. We apply 6% to this property because it is a mid-rise property with um, a year built to 1960, effective age of 1960. So therefore, they received the highest cap rate for that category. Uh, we proposed a revision, uh, bringing the 2021 assessment down from 14 million 999,800 to 14,664,500. Uh, that is the value we propose to the appellants, and that is the value that we ask that the board accepts. Um, yes, there is mention of Virginia Code 3295.1, which says you shall consider actuals. When we look at the history of this property, we do believe we have considered the actuals, um, mainly based off the revisions that we made. Again, the adjustment to the apartment revenue is $60,000 less than what they reported for 2020. Um, our GPI is less than what they reported for 2020 when you compare columns E and F. Um, the basis really is that they took the actuals, applied their projected cap rate, and that's their value. So we ask that you accept our proposed value. That is all I have. I am here for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Questions from any board members? Speak up, Barnes. Yeah, Mary, this is Barnes. Um, if I could ask, um, um, is it Mr. Hammond? Hammond? Mr. Harmon. Harmon, okay. Yes. I can't read because you're, you're, you're in the window. Your oh. name is in the window and I couldn't read the letters. Um, Normally, I don't get into this, but in the uh, expense, income expense um, summary that your um, client submitted, um, I see HVAC repairs, which seems really high. I see decorating, painting, carpet, etc., really high. And then I see miscellaneous repairs. And I'm just, I guess my question is, why are these so high? And should some of these be 
improvements vis-a-vis -vis expenses? Well, I can't, I can't answer that specifically, but I do believe with a building being 60 years old without having undergone any ma major renovations, these are the types of repairs that, you know, that is to be expected. And you can see that from, uh, as the county has said, the three-year operating history that was provided on page three, the operating expenses, this in 2020 are in line, even with those uh, individual line items possibly being a bit higher than expected. Uh, you can see 2017, 50% expenses, 2018, 54, 2019, 51, and 2020 is at 53%. So uh, those individual line items may stick out this year. However, I, I you know, I, I can follow up with that with the owner and see what specifically they did. However, I, I think that with a property that's 60 years old without any major renovations, this these types of repairs are, are to be expected and they are in line with the prior three year operating history. Yeah, I hear what you're saying um, on the, the um, and I guess I'll, I'll ask uh, the county this, when, a, um, when an apartment building replaces carpet, is that an expense or is that a, an improvement? But how does the county typically handle that? If an apartment building replaces all the carpets throughout the property, then that's a capital expense. Um, if it's where you're doing turnover and you have to repair or replace carpet in a single room or whatever, that's turnover cost. So we laid that out in the instructions on the I and E. Um, honestly, I think the expenses are in line with what they reported over the years. Right. So I, don't I really saw that. Issue with it. Okay. Thank you. My questions have been answered. All right, other questions? No? Okay, Mr. Bailey, if you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Um, okay, again, as we stated, this property has really been stabilized throughout the years. Um, they did have a bump in 2020 for vacancy. Uh, we are really pointing to how we made an adjustment to the apartment revenue. Uh, when you look at the documents provided by the appellant, from 2019 to 2020, only two units had their rent rate changed. Um, one bedrooms with one baths, uh, there's 27 units, they reduced their rent by $8. Um, two bedrooms, one bath, is 21 units, they reduced their rent by $5. Uh, so that's why you can see that in 2020, they actually reported a higher potential apartment revenue. Um, again, we made adjustments to the original assessment based off this information. And the value that we come to is 14 million six sixty four five hundred, and that's what we're proposing to the board today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jordan. If you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Yes, thank you. So I understand, and and I can see. So first, let me clarify that column G on the test page, it says appellant pro forma. That is actually the 2020 operating results that were reported on the I and E, and provided to the county. So. The GPI is higher than what the county assessed it at. However, that difference doesn't account for the, the wide gulf in vacancy and collection. So, you know, that it is 69,000 lower. However, the vacancy and collection is more well above that. So, you know, we ask that the 11% vacancy and collection be applied as the property actually experienced. And this again is in line with the county code 3295.1, and that a copy of that is provided for you on page 35 of the appeal packet. I'd like to also state that, uh, you know, mention of two year averages were made and, you know, they may fall in line, but these are annual assessments. So what we're operating under is 2020 had an 11% vacancy in collection. If that goes back down in 2021 to 6%, by all means, you know, assess it at 6% next year. But for this year, we ask that uh, the actual income and expenses be considered per the Code of Virginia. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, among the board, what's everybody think? Mr. Maskin. I um, found the department's treatment of this property very, very consistent with other similar properties, meaning multifamily. Um, vacancy went up unusually high for obvious reasons. 
So they ended up reducing from recent experience, especially in a stabilized property like this, still reducing an upward trend of uh, GPI uh, and also increasing a recent trend a, a little bit for operating expenses and then overlaying 6% vacancy for all. Um, so, I mean, do we have it exactly on the mark? No, we never know that. But we see it's going, the, the treatment is is appropriate. And, in, in, and, and, and also, finally, to the appellant's last notion of um, it's a one-year assessment, but it's still an overall trend in order to make the one-year assessment to wildly change assessments from year to year based on vicissitudes gets a little scary, but it can also be accommodated by below the line adjustments, particularly when there's something extraordinary that's happened in a particular property. So I, I support this uh, approach and, and the resultant uh, amended um, assessment. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mitchell? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chairman. Um, um, as everyone knows, when when legislation comes out of the General Assembly, it's um, everybody who has an opinion um, shares their opinion. And what comes out of legislation is often not very clear and doesn't give us really great direction. <clears throat> and the direction we have from the General Assembly is that the actual shall be considered. And what does considered mean? Does it mean, yeah, we considered it and we chose to pay no attention to it? Or does it mean we have to consider it and do exactly what it is? Um, I don't know um, <laughs> what it means exactly. Um, what the department has done here um, is gone with the 6%, which is their you know, their standard um, that they're using throughout. Um, if you take a look at the actual operation and then compare it to um, uh, where the department is, you're off by about 600,000. And, you know, it, it just seems to me that when you're when you're obligated to consider something, you can't just go with with the way it's always been. It's always been 6%. And so um, I think I think that some, you know, I'll use the term consideration, some consideration should have been given to that higher than normal vacancy. And if you take the operating year and um, go ahead and apply the county's cap rate, you end up at 14,058,966. That's where I would suggest um, the assessment ought to be. Uh, and I'll just see if anyone else agrees with that. I'll just say I certainly um, can see where you're coming from on that, but I also see Mr. Maskin's point because I look at this and think to myself, if next year, I'm just going to throw a number out there, you know, the NOI is 980,000, do we all of a sudden then take that pinpoint and say, all right, it's an annual assessment, we increase it for that. So it is based on trends, and I, I think the county did its best in trying to reduce you know, the NOI down when you look at what they did in the test column. So I'm, I'm kind of torn between them. I don't yeah. think that necessarily, because then we've got completely um, absence of equalization where, you know, because these guys appealed and we have their numbers that we just took their numbers and changed their assessment and it throws everybody else out. So I, I based on that, would lean more towards Mr. Matskin. But what and, everybody and, else. Yeah, and Mary, and also I guess the, the opposite could be claim and that is if your vacancy is one percent then we need to up it so i, I think you know i'm struggling with this I, I i truly am and uh i'll just see what others think mr hoffman i i think i'm i'm siding with the county's column f here just because they're it's pretty close but um they gave them a little bit more on the expenses which i think is probably accurate for a building of this age and and you know you got to think about it, the difference between six percent and eleven percent vacancy in a small building like this is only a hand you know it's five units um 
so I, I can definitely see in 2020 people move five people deciding to move out of this building if it's not being run well um and then i could see everybody going back to work and coming back and going back down to zero vacancy so you, you know we're not talking about 50 80 100 units like some of those big ditmar buildings that we reviewed this is you know a handful of people made a decision to move out so i'm, I'm okay with the county any other mr panoranda uh yes thank you mary uh I think in most cases we do consider the numbers from the appellant <clears throat> and uh, I don't think it's just that we totally just ignore them. I think when the numbers really don't add up as far as GPI, EGI, NOI, I think, yeah, we, we have considered them in the past. Um, the only thing that I, in this case, if there was any change to be made, uh, you know, when I look at the total uh, operating expenses for the past three years, I come up with an average of about 965,407, which are a little higher than what we have from the county. And also on the NOI, um, when I do also a three year average for the past three years, um, my average is 868,596. So, uh, and the county is still a little bit higher than that. So, you know, my su suggestion, if there was going to be any change to be made, it would be pretty much just to increase the expenses by 1% uh, to 53%, which gives me a number of, of 971,520. It's a minor reduction, uh, but I think it kind of reflects the numbers that we have as far as uh, uh, equalizing the and you know using the averages for the past three years uh, I'm not sure if the one percent reduction would be you know, warranted in this case but like I said if there was any change to be made that would be my only suggestion to be uh, done yeah uh, by doing that I come up with an NOI of 861536 which reduces the value to 14 million three fifty eight nine thirty three. Uh, I know, like I said, it's a minor reduction from uh, what the county suggested, but uh, uh, that's the only thing that I see that it's a little bit off. Mr. Maskin. Yeah, I wasn't sure what I was going to say. So, Jose, you think that minor tweak, and it's not minor to the, the appellant, it's money saved, is is legitimate, and, and you think that what you're saying is the, the department's column F went in the right direction, but not quite enough. That's your sincere opinion? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. And Mr. Yates? I had looked at this, and I thought the county's numbers, and coming up with their numbers, they did a reasonably good job. Uh, the only thing that really stood out to me, I, like I think everyone else, is the vacancy. But, it is at a 90 unit 91 unit building it's not a lot and that does reflect the year but they're sticking you know the guidelines in which what's applied to everyone else pretty much is the you know the six percent and i came up with the county's revised number as being acceptable uh i do understand the appellant's position in it but i think the county did a Decent job. Yeah, Mr. Lawson. Um, yeah, I know we're not supposed to ask questions of one another. I've been uh, corrected on that. It would seem to me that what Jose proposed, um, I, I think my proposal I've been talked out of. Um, and I think what, what Jose proposed does in fact give quote consideration to the actuality and um, I would be inclined to go with Jose uh, with Jose's proposal. Yeah, the, the only issue I see with it is it may be the running average but if we're looking at you know one year's information Jose the number that you've got for expenses of 971 520 is certainly more than the one year as reported so it just seems like we're adjusting expenses to make the number come in a little bit lower when the issue is really the vacancy, in my mind. Um, right. 
Right, it's about uh, 6,000 higher than the three year average. Uh, as I come up with a, a 53%, it's 975, 971.520, and the three year average for the past three years is 965.407. That, but it actually reported 939, so it's like we're right. increasing the expenses just to kind of fix the number, so we feel better. I don't, I don't know whether I'm not. I, I guess I'm. No, don't don't take me wrong. I'm okay with the revised, but like I said, if there was any change to be made, I would suggest to do that. But uh, if the majority thinks that we uh, they're okay with the uh, proposed uh, adjusted, uh, I'm okay with it. Is, okay. uh, it, it seems that none of us wants to accept column D, the original assessment. Each of us wants to tweak down a little bit. And um, I, I'm with Mary on her assessment of adjusting the operating expenses to get it. And I'm hoping that we don't get in loggerheads such that it goes back to the original, but rather perhaps the one in the middle, which is column F. All right, so Mr. Gates. Well, I think, I think it, I think it comes down to the vacancy and, and really is where things are maybe out of line from the past. And are we willing to look at vacancy or anything other than the 6% guideline? Yeah, Mr. Mr. But re remember that we've seen this many times. The, yeah. the department does lower GPI, does increase um, operating expenses to offset to an extent within a reasonable range that unusual vacancy that almost everybody faced on New Year's Eve 2020 and then adds 6%. And, and of course, we can't know if it should be 5 or 7 or but we're treating everybody equally. So, I mean, so they are trying. They are making adjustments beyond just the vacancy uh, 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 universal guideline number. So let's not us forget that. Okay, uh, Ms. Hogan, where are you on this? Um, I, I like the way Jose uh, went about it, so I'm going to go with that number. Okay. Mr. Hoffman? Um, I'm on board with Jose right now. With, I'm sorry, with Jose's reduction or the county? The reduction uh, based on changing the uh, expenses with the average. I could see where, where you start to your expenses are going to start to creep up as your building gets more vacant. You try to turn units and you try to fix the door that was always broken that the, the tenant was living with and you go in and you do things that um, are going to push that number up from the average. Okay, so I just want to make sure I believe we've got four that could live with that. I because I don't want to have somebody make a motion. I mean, I don't agree with that methodology. I, I certainly could live with the number, but I don't agree with the methodology. I just don't want it to revert back to the original. That's where I am too. I, I think I think if I don't think it's really an expense issue, but it does adjust it some. Okay. All right. Somebody, Mr. Penaround, if you want to make the motion. Sure. I'll go ahead and move that we reduce the assessment to 14 million. 358,900 based on increasing the expenses on the revised assessment to 53%. I'll second. Okay, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, I'm opposed. And it's just the methodology of using the expenses to do it, but otherwise, um, I'm fine. So, okay, so it's reduced to 14,358,900 based on increasing the expense to 53%. Thank you. I'm sorry, can you tell me how the vote was? Six to one. Okay, thank you. Thank you, board. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Board. Bailey. You're welcome, Ms. Borman. Nice meeting you, Jordan. Nice to meet you as well. Have a good day. Your first case. Yeah, you did a nice job. <laughs> we have Mr. Steinhauser. We have Mr. Thompson here. I'm going to be filling in for Mr. Steinhauser. Okay. And I see Mr. Chicas. All right. So the 
the next case on the agenda is RPC 16018146, the property located at 1121 19th Street North. Mr. Thompson, you can start with your eight minutes and tell us about the property. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if I can. Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. OK, uh, the subject property is known as the Meridian Arlington. Um, you all may be familiar with this particular complex. It's called Waterview. Um, it's a office tower. And then within this particular tower, there are 133 residential condos as well as a 154 key uh, Meridian Hotel. The proposed assessment for tax year 2021 is 36 million 646 400. We're seeking a value of 27 million, which represents a 26% reduction. Um, certainly one of the challenges I think across the assessing community and indeed the commercial real estate community at large as of January 1st, 2021 was how to value um, hospitality properties. Obviously, um, COVID decimated the industry and the 2020 actual income and expense was of little to no help in determining the appropriate fair market value as of our data value. Um, what we did is we looked to the experts um, in this particular industry. So HVS is known as the premier uh, valuation company when it comes to hotels. And so um, they released several different studies and several different articles uh, regarding how to value hospitality properties in, in the age of COVID. And we were we were fortunate in that they drilled down to address some DC specific issues. Um, obviously, the DC metro area has has always benefited from uh, the federal government, and there's a pretty significant portion of uh, revenue for hotels that's generated through not only convention style business but also business travel. And so the major issue um, that they're contending with is. Will they ever be able to get back to the levels of RevPAR that we saw pre pandemic? And so, obviously, 2019, I think, by all accounts, was a pretty healthy year uh, for the DC hotel market. And so, um, the error that we think exists in the valuation methodology employed by the county is that they've only adjusted um, one year. So, they basically are assuming that the property. Uh, hotel properties will rebound to pre pandemic levels um, by the end of this year, uh, which obviously is not the case. And so you can see um, there weren't any, um, we didn't, we looked at the cost approach, deemed that was inappropriate due to the age and condition of this hotel, uh, and also deriving a land value would be near impossible given the commingling of the, um, the condo and hotel. Additionally, there were no sales to go off of in 2020. Um, so what we, we chose to do is to do a discounted cash flow approach, um, which according to various investor surveys is how the market would indeed treat this type of property as of our data value. And so you'll see highlighted there on page three of 66, that quote from RERC, their fourth quarter 2020 survey, uh, which states that investors looking at this type of property are doing a discounted cash flow. Um, again, we were able to look at a, a uh, an article authored by Ms. Leffitt of HVS, and basically what she had done is um, forecasted the quote unquote return to a normal state of stabilized NOI. And you can see um, those various changes highlighted in that table there on page three of 66. And we've used these um, adjustments to NOI in our DCF. For this particular property, um, and I do wanna say that there were several cases, hotel cases where we were able to come to a meeting of the minds and, and agreed on a value. Um, this unfortunately wasn't one of them. Um, the operating expense ratio employed by the county was 63.3% which is too low in light of historic operations and the county's own, own guidelines at 68.2 percent and we use that 68.2 percent because it's it's guidelines and also because the expenses as reported on the INE for this particular property 
are less than market due to the commingling of the two spaces. So they share some expenses with the condo building as well. Um, with regard to the cap rate, the county increased their base rate by 50 basis points over the 2020 cap rate. However, there were no sales from which to derive those cap rates. Um, so we were a little confused as to how that, that 50 basis points was determined. Uh, we looked at RERC's fourth quarter Washington DC hotel cap rates, which we think better reflects the market thinking. Uh, you'll notice in the county's uh, direct income capitalization approach that they've made a one-time adjustment equal to 65% of total revenue. Unfortunately, that doesn't go far enough in this particular instance. Uh, this hotel experienced a decline in revenue of, of 70%. And so we think at a minimum that that adjustment below the line should be increased to 70%. Um, again, we did a DCF uh, model that utilized those uh, aforementioned uh, percentage changes in RevPAR um, to, from a stabilized NOI through the recovery to the new normal in 2024. Our terminal cap rate is 100 basis points higher than the rate indicated by surveys as of our data value. And this is meant to account for the additional risk and um, was also the method prescribed uh, in the HVS survey. Uh, we reconciled our two approaches to value to an opinion of 27 million or $175,000 per key. Um, again, here's just a summary of the assessment, of the 2021 guidelines value, and then our DCF. You can see you reconciled there to 27 million. On this page, six of 66, you'll see the actual 2017 and then 2019 and 2020. And you can see um, that the operating expenses are 64.3 and 64.8. Uh, again, the county used 63.3. We think that guidelines should be employed at 68.2. Uh, county's base cap rate is 7.35 versus our 7.8, which was the RERC DC estimate for first tier hotel properties. Again, the COVID effect you'll see here um, under the actual 2020, the decline in, in revenue was 70%, and the county has only accounted for 65%. On page seven of 66, on the left side, you'll see this is what a DCF would look like pre-COVID. So we basically took the stabilized NOI, grew it by 2% per year, um, used a discount rate of 10%, and you can see the value that that gives off absent COVID would be 37.9 million, which is remarkably close to the county's assessment. However, when you take into account in the, the section on the right, um, the fact that the NOI dropped off by, according to this survey, 63.2% for 2020, it would then rebound by 43%, uh, 39%, 20%, and then 10%. And that would get us back to a stabilized NOI. Um, again, we used a 10% discount rate, a terminal cap rate of 100 basis points higher than, than our going in rate. And you can see there that that generates a value of 31.9 million, uh, less the FF&E um, yields a value remarkably similar to our, dis our uh, direct capitalization approach as well. Um, continuing on down, you've, you've just got um, continued support in terms of articles, income and expense, et cetera, which I'm sure you've had a chance to take a look at. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. And can you remove the shared screen? Please. Mr. Thompson. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And Mr. Chicas for the county, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, board members. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. This is morning. essentially a kind of a revisitation of some cases uh, reviews we did uh, approximately two or three weeks ago. Um, again, echoing Mr. Thompson's uh, comments, uh, hotel industry was devastated. Uh, we know that um, the county tried to reflect that in its uh, below the line uh, COVID adjustment. Uh, we've spoken about that now, I believe, uh, at least five or six cases. Um, you know, it's really just a difference of opinion, as Mr. Thompson indicated, uh, one driven by an investor uh, a point of view uh, supported by a discounted cash flow analysis, another from the standpoint of mass appraisal uh, for property tax valuation. 
uh, and supported by, uh, again, mass appraisal standards. Um, we're an annual assessment. Uh, so, you know, right off the bat, one of the things Mr. Thompson echoed was uh, he believes uh, we erred in not uh, looking at this set as a uh, more than one year adjustment. Uh, but again, as we echoed in previous cases, we're an annual assessment. So any adjustment made beyond this year would be inappropriate as again, we'll look at new information as it comes to us. Um, there is some uh, talk of the disparity in the cap rates. Uh, and I think as Mr. Thompson noted, uh, relying heavily upon the RERC fourth quarter report uh, is something that came out in late December, early January. Uh, that's not something we we're privy to, obviously, before the January 1 assessment uh, was issued. Uh, we talked a little bit about, in previous cases, how we came up with our COVID adjustments. Uh, we do believe it was done in a prudent manner. Uh, this was done in conjunction with ownership uh, response to our, our partial year IE, the COVID IE, as we called it. Uh, again, as we remind the board, we did make a below the line adjustment of negative 65% of total revenue for full service uh, hotels as this one is. Uh, and as we talked about, uh, because we are mass appraisal, uh, we're looking at this from a mass appraisal uh, set of eyes, we can't make individual adjustments uh, for those individual revenue drops. Uh, we talked specifically about that in previous cases. Uh, and in this one, it's echoed again in that uh, Mr. Thompson would like a below the line adjustment uh, uh, mirroring what the property actually incurred, and that's a negative 70% drop of revenue. Um, obviously, again, we didn't, uh, weren't made aware of that until uh, sometime March, April, whenever the INEs came in, and we knew the exact amount. But even then, as we previously stated, because again, we're mass appraisals, we can't go to those other 41 properties and adjust all of them to the actual total revenue lost. Uh, we did apply that below the line adjustment of neg negative 65%. Uh, we do believe that was done in a prudent manner. Uh, it's done equitably with other properties, all full service, uh, all select service received this adjustment. Uh, we do believe that the drop off is uh, consistent with the, the, what we've seen and that this was a 22% drop off year over year. Uh, the appellants uh, calling for a drop of approximately 43% or so. Um, uh, and it's just, a, it's a bit too aggressive in, in, in a one year snapshot. Uh, uh, we are an annual assessment. We'll see what happens in 2021 and, and continue from there. Uh, it's not to disparage the entirety of the idea of a DCF, uh, but I believe we've spoken about that before as well. Uh, that has not uh, done well in, in, in the eyes of Virginia courts, uh, partially because of the idea that it's, it's quite literally built upon assumptions uh, and those assumptions we've already seen this year have been broken up uh, quite frankly the 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 hvs uh, reports that came out at the beginning of the year uh, have obviously been altered quite heavily uh, as the year has progressed um, things have changed uh, the vaccines have, have gone out uh, we're still relying on uh, uh, waiting on uh, consumer travel to to not only buoy corporate travel, but, uh, you know, if corporate travel comes back, but that's something to keep in mind with this property as well. This really isn't a, a hotel that's reliant on corporate travel. There's only some 3,000 square feet of meeting space. So this, again, is, is more your transient occupancy, uh, someone who's stopping by, who's in the area. Uh, and it should be noted, too, with the close of the Holiday Inn and the Marriott Key Bridge, this is now the closest hotel in Arlington to D.C., uh, quite literally across the bridge. Uh, it's an upper upscale property as detailed by uh, CoStar. Uh, we believe that uh, the, the value indication that we've given is indicative of the drop in revenue. So again, we're not, uh, we're being very prudent uh, because this is a property that uh, we know uh, won't reach 2019 levels, but in fact, we're even below 2018 levels. Uh, and again, I believe that should be noted by the board. So we're showing, as we have before in previous uh, uh, hotel cases, uh, that we're a stabilized property. Uh, we've uh, uh, developed this below the line COVID adjustment so that we believe is fair and prudent. Uh, again, applicable to all other properties, uh, full service or select service. Uh, again, we've reflected the negative over negative 22% uh, drop year over year. Uh, and we again believe that's just too aggressive uh, from the appellant side to call for a change of over 40% uh, drop in value uh, based upon one year. Again, it's an annual assessment, so we do believe that the appropriate way to value this is the way we have uh, direct capitalization of the income approach, uh, stabilized property, and again, reflective of that negative 65% adjustment. 
Uh, these things being said, uh, treating this property equally with other properties like it, so we do believe that the uh, county should be confirmed at thirty-six million six hundred forty-six thousand four hundred. Anything to add, Irving? Uh, yeah, just briefly uh, to kind of go back to the statement about business travel. Um, as Chris indicated, like this property isn't one that depends on conferences or utilization of the meeting space because it's small meeting space. Uh, we do know that some business travelers do stay at different hotels because of proximity to their clients. So we just want to make sure that we uh, make that statement more clear about what we meant. Um, also, as far as the DCF, just a quick touch on that. As the board knows, we don't do DCF um, for assessment purposes. Um, conversation with other surrounding jurisdictions in Virginia, they don't use the DCF approach either mainly because of all the men, uh, many assumptions that you have to make when you do a DCF. I mean, we make a few assumptions based off our guidelines to value these properties and they're contested every year. So I can imagine if we did a DCF with the numerous assumptions we have to make, how many more cases we would have. But we also have a court case that um, was with Arlington County versus I think like Marriott. DCF was used in that case and not accepted by the judge. And that's pretty much all we need to say about that method of evaluation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Questions from board members? No? Mr. Hoffman. Is this for the appellant? Um, would you say that what's the ratio between business and leisure travel at this location? I couldn't tell you right offhand. Um, I think I think I would I would agree with the assessors that um, there's not a tremendous amount of meeting space here, um, but that doesn't mean that the profile of the traveler there wouldn't be, you know, people traveling to DC on business. I guess just follow up the, the food and beverages um, looks like a pretty decent amount of revenue. So is that a restaurant or a bar or something does? And has that bar been open? Um, there's a restaurant there called Amuse, and yes, it has been open. Other questions? No? All right. Uh, Mr. Chikas, if you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Yes, ma'am. So again, uh, in continuation with how we treated other hotel, full service hotels this year, uh, these past several weeks, uh, we do believe that uh, to take into account uh, anything more than the below the line adjustment that's been applied to all full service and select service hotels would be inappropriate. Uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, inapplicability of the DCF approach as opposed to direct utilization. Uh, and again, just moreover that the uh, idea of a, a negative 22% drop is fair and prudent uh, and, and uh, the negative 43% or so drop uh, uh, called for by the appellant is a bit too aggressive. Um, that being said, we do believe that the county should be confirmed at a value of 36646400 Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thompson, if you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, just a few quick wrap-up items. Um, obviously, I understand it's an annual assessment, um, but the test here is always what is the fair market value as of January 1, 2021. And on page 30 of 74, um, we've got from RERC, you can see um, hotel respondents indicated that the way that they're valuing properties as of the date of value is through a DCF. So um, I certainly understand the county's perspective in, in treating everyone equally, um, but what I didn't hear them ad uh, address in their response was if they're going to use the full service guidelines, why didn't they use the full service expenses on our hotel? Um, if they're going to treat everyone the same way. So I would ask that you at least make that adjustment in, in increasing the expense ratio. Um, again, because the, the expenses reported here are, are a little bit underreported due to the commingling of, of the building. Um, I would also point out that, yes, you know, everybody across the country is struggling with how do we value these properties. I would point out that Loudoun County in Virginia, they reduced all of their assessments on hotels to land value only. Um, because of the uncertainty and, and the difficulty with this particular asset class. Um, so I don't think that our requested reduction is unreasonable in light of, of the expected 
recovery timeline in the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, it's just among the board members. What's everybody think? Mr. Hoffman. I mean, I took a look at it. Um, a different, pretty pretty close to what the appellants pro forma, but then um, using the county's cap rate and taking the COVID adjustment out, and I end up with a higher value. It's like 30, uh, 37, 37, five, So I, I don't think I want to go that route. Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what everybody has to say, but uh, I think the county's has got a pretty deep reduction here for one year. Um, for a, a fairly prime hotel. So I'd um, like to hear what y'all think. Mr. Maskin. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I wrote three times uh, notes on guidelines for operating expenses. And where I came out at, and I get feedback from anybody if I miss the mark. In a stabilized property, we don't necessarily go with guidelines. We go with what the established um, trend is. Um, so, uh, as opposed to as opposed to vacancy, oftentimes in, in multifamily or hotels, where in, in multifamily, where it's again sometimes they're above, sometimes they're below. So at first, I didn't. I questioned myself, why doesn't the guide? Why don't we use guidelines for operating expenses? And I realized. No, no, this is stabilized and this is legitimate uh, with the county stuff. Uh, also, uh, the department has um, has treated this hotel uh, just like others. Um, and interestingly, this hotel's NOI did not drop in these you know terrible times to no fault of their own, nearly as much as others that we've seen. But yet, the the decrease for the assessment is about the same um, as others. And finally. I would challenge the owner to sell this thing on January 1st, 2021 for $27 million, given that the, the COVID, um, I, I, I've got noise outside, I apologize. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm in my office. Um, that, I mean, COVID, although it's not going away as quickly as we had hoped, based on recalcitrance of the population, nevertheless does have an end. Um, this isn't something, uh, a structural adjustment to the economy such that this hotel can't possibly be worth anything near to what it should be. So given that we do trends here and not annual whipsaws, this seems to be a, a good assessment as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Other folks? Mr. Lawson. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to to speak very briefly about the the shared expenses because um, that's the situation where I live, and uh, the expenses that we share are the garage, the loading dock, um, and then the roof. Um, and the situation that we have is the hotel pays, and then we reimburse. And I'm not necessarily sure uh, <clears throat> that an adjustment should be made based upon that uh, without more evidence of that other than just saying, well, we share some expenses, therefore it ought to be higher. I think we would uh, need to see that in years to come uh, demonstrated a little bit more clearly. I think the only question that, that I have after analyzing all this is um, the county used the 65% and this is from memory. It seems like that's been disputed with several cases now. And my my recollection is that um, we had one hotel that was right at 65, and then we had a couple that were, uh, one was higher than 70, one was around 70. So I think the, the only question that I would have um, is should we should we up the 65%? Uh, that, that would be the only, um, the only question I would have other than that, I think what the county has done um, is fine. Other folks? Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, I mean, on the expenses, that was my initial thinking for, 
looking at the appellants pro forma because uh, I think that uh, just conversations I've had with some hotel operators, it, it's extremely difficult to keep to 2018, 2019 budget numbers on expenses right now. They're having a hard time getting cleaning crews um, and, uh, you know, housekeeping staff. So they've kind of turned, a lot of these hotels have turned to outsourcing that, which gets pricey. Um, so, um, you know, I could see that expense number being right on with the appellants pro forma. But then, you know, if you if you use their numbers, you still come up with a higher number than what the department um, has on the income approach. And I'm, I'm talking about taking that bottom line 8.7 million out of the equation. Um, because once you look at it from a pro forma basis on the appellants numbers, you no longer get a lump sum reduction below the line. So um, that's why I'm okay with the county, but I do think the expenses are, are low on the counties. Greg, did you, yeah. pardon me, did you run it looking at just using the county, or excuse me, the appellant's expenses into the county's assessment? Just no, that, would, assessment? that would take it down quite a bit. Um, I didn't do that. I didn't either. Actually, you know what that 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 because the revenue for the count the county and the assess or the county and the appellant are using the same for total revenue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I I would take out that COVID adjustment line. That's the way I I calculated it. So that's why it ended up being higher. We did adjust one of them. We did adjust one in the past based on the. Uh, COVID adjustment being higher than the 65 percent. Yeah, that was my recollection. Yeah. When I did that example, when I did that math and I made the the I took the 20 uh, 2021 assessment and then I upped it to 70 and it went to 36.015669. Um, so if we make an adjustment, I kind of like what Jose said last case, you know, I'm not necessarily sure we need to make this adjustment, but if we do, that would be, you know, one suggestion. Okay, so where is everybody on that? Make the adjustment or not? I, I would lean towards not, but Mr. Panaranda. Can you turn your microphone on, sir? Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not too inclined to make any changes in this case. Uh, I think for purposes of equalizing with how other hotels have been assessed using the adjustments below the line, I think I'm okay with it. I'm looking at all the other numbers, especially specifically NOIs and um, compared to other years, I'm okay with it. So, uh, and I think the 65% adjustment below the line, I think it's more than appropriate, uh, in my opinion, you know, more than that, I don't see why, uh, you know, these assessments are made year by year, so to apply a 12 month adjustment, uh, I think it's, uh, in my opinion, the right way, but I'm okay with the assessment. Okay. Anyone else different? All right, would somebody like to make a motion? I'll go ahead and move that we confirm the assessment at uh, 36 million 646 400. Mr. Maskin is second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. The counties um, confirmed at 36 million 646 400. Okay, on the, the third case, RPC 34027562 at 2800 Potomac Avenue. Um, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Steinhauser have um, sent a letter of acceptance to the county accepting their revised number. I assume there's no objection from the county that's been accepted? No, ma'am. Yeah, we accept that. Okay. All right, then um, because of the late hour of it, then I will move to accept the withdrawal for a second. Okay, a second by Ms. Hogan, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. 
So that's unanimous. Um, that withdrawal is accepted. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, board members. Okay, any other business Thanks. from the county or the board members in regard to um, anything but the schedule? Because <laughs> we'll do that off. No? Okay, all right, then we will adjourn here at 10.03 and readjourn tomorrow, um, 8.11 at 9 a.m. I just want to point out, though, um, Rosa did send out some corrections to the folders to make sure when you're reviewing it, um, there was some additional information put in, I think, late last night or this morning. Okay. Thank you, then. We can go ahead and adjourn. And, um, if the board members just will stay on so we can finish up the schedule, that would be perfect.